if you wander into a, like an, a disused building and take some photographs, you'll get some great moody kind of photographs. If you spend some time there, I'm convinced that the photographs you then take will be will be different. Just just because you you get used to the building and you get you, you see things, you know, it's, it is it is the same as listening. If you listen for longer, you hear more. And if you if you look around a space or, or look at a subject for longer, you see more. And if you see more, then obviously your photography is going to hopefully reflect. You know, because you can get two field recorders and two photographers stood side by side in a field with exactly the same equipment, recording exactly the same thing, photographing exactly the same thing, and yet the results might be very, very subtly different, but there will be a difference. And I'm kind of interested in how much of that difference is down to slight adjustments in the technology and how much of it is down to the perception of the person and who that person is. I mean, I think one of the, the uh, relationships that photography and sound share is a relationship to something like uh, stillness or immersion. And it's about the role that the photographer or field recordist has to the environment that surrounds her. That for the photographer is a kind of looking and seeing, and for the field recordist is a kind of listening. And this is in part a kind of preliminary investigation. It's in part a way of the recordist calibrating their sensibility, attuning themselves to the environment. What I would probably do if I was recording here for a long period of time is set my microphone on the, on the grass, in the reeds. And then I'd just be interested in leaving my bag here and, and, and walking off and sitting down quietly and then just record for a long period of time, maybe, maybe an hour or so. And what, I, what I really like is the tiny little cracks and creaks of the reeds. Very pleasing sound. Yeah, quite often I leave it and, and then get out of the sound picture if you like. And I think that you can make uh, persuasive comparisons between some kinds of field recording practice and those photographers who've come in the wake of something like the new topographics movement. So those photographers who are concerned to reveal particular kinds of relationship to the landscape, to uh, the man-altered environment in the, in the subtitle of, the, of that exhibition, share, I think, a sensibility with some kinds of field recordists who are particularly interested, for example, in the long take recording, so very long duration recordings that uh, work hand in hand with considerable periods of immersion in a particular environment. Our ears and our, and our, our collective minds look at a, a natural landscape and perceive it as something very idyllic and quite soft sonically but it's actually utter chaos you know it's 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 really much more intense especially for the creatures who who dwell in it other than ourselves you know um, the volume levels are intense you know massive much more than, than us humans can create so I'm just going to attach some contact mics to some of these uh, reeds here and see See what we're we're picking up as the reeds brush against each other, because things get more and more interesting the longer you listen. Because they you're allowing the the place to impose itself on you rather than you impose yourself on it. So that's why I'm, I'm one of the things I do quite a lot of now is very durational recordings. So let's see if we're getting anything here. Thank <laughs> you. 
I've, I've never got on. I've tried to learn how to write music in the traditional notated form. And there's always been a massive disconnect for me between written music and, and the power of the, the, the music itself. I've never felt that connection, uh, which I guess is why some composers are better than others. And I can't do that. Whereas a, a, a photograph for me can, can appear musical. It can convey something of that same emotion as you get listening to a, a choir singing a piece of talis or whatever. Um, so I started to, quite early on, maybe when I was about 18, 19, I started to mess around with putting photographs into, onto musical paper, music notation paper. And there was more cues for improvisation at that point. And for the last five or six years, I've been making scores for listening. So these are images with a few, a few suggestions at the bottom, like literally a one sentence, just, you know, basic instructions on how to approach the score. So that basically it's just a cue for somebody to go to a space, look at the image, look at the space, and, and it's a cue for them to listen, really. We are a very visual animal, you know, we, we pay more attention to visuals than we ever do to sound, you know. So using a photograph can be a trigger for listening, you know, I think in quite a successful way. Obviously if the audience are open to the idea, you know. So. Would it work for film, or would it work for the written word? Um, would it work for sculpture? How far can you go with um, understanding um, the, uh, the capturing of uh, the world's sound and light through different media um, and their appreciation as kind of triggers for different kinds of uh, emotional and uh, cognitive engagement? My suspicion is that photography and sound recording do share something particular, something peculiar that isolates them from other media. Okay, um, yeah. We, 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 if we have the case of, of a sound recording artist who's interested in working with a landscape uh, as a way of producing an artwork that's expressive or representational um, in, in, in creative ways, then standardly what we might be thinking is that what's available to sound recorders is to take the kinds of sounds that are appearing, um, perhaps that are available to the human ear in that landscape at that moment in time, and simply documenting them. And perhaps um, doing that in a particularly spectacular way, but nonetheless simply working with the elements that, that are there to be heard. And I think instead of thinking of, of it in a, in, a, in a documentary function in that way, we could actually think about how um, how a, a, a sound recordist, like a photographer, uses the objects that are available in that environment and scene as if they are, let's say, instruments. So just as a photographer is bouncing light off objects uh, in order to record them on the photosensitive surface, he's actually using those objects as if they are paintbrushes applying paint to a canvas. I think uh, a sound artist can do exactly the same thing with objects in the scene that reflect sound or emit sound. And, and thinking of it that way, um, that, though, that those sound making objects are instruments there for, as if, if you like, orchestrating a piece of work, composing a piece of work by understanding how those instruments can work together and produce um, produce a score that is then the recording um, leaves us in a position to, to think quite differently about the, the creativity of the medium. It's no longer just has to be understood as a documentary and representational medium. Instead we've got the, the possibility here of full-blown orchestral composition um, just using the objects in the landscape. I've always, I've always been fascinated by photography as a musical, a musical object. You know, when I was very young, 12 or so, I got interested in sound recording by accident and also new wave and punk. So, so the idea of design connected to music, even though I didn't think of this at the time as a 12 year old, but it was obviously there. So I've always had this connection to, to, between photography and sound or music. And now, most of my photographs tend to be quite abstract. 
um, and I think most of my recordings tend to be quite similar. I'm, I'm not I'm not often very interested in in recording uh, an idea of a of a natural soundscape, whatever, whatever that means. You know, so so I'll use contact microphones or hydrophones or geophones, ultrasonic detectors, whatever, um, and that creates. To, to other listeners, a very abstract sense of the place. You know, they can't necessarily tell that, that the sound that they're hearing is that fence or that reed blowing in the wind or whatever. Um, so for me, in my own work, the connection there is, is again, it's this idea of, of, of having an emotive sense of place. So a, a, f- a photograph, perhaps, of a metal staircase will just be a tonal picture of, of, of how metal decays over time. Uh, as just an example, and 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 nobody would perhaps know that that's a staircase looking at it, but they would get a sense of metal and, and connected with the sound, perhaps start to read into it various things. If there is anything of me in the work, then it comes from me as a person rather than me as a, a field recordist. You know, I don't, I don't. If I was a, if I was a field recordist, then I'd probably spend time calibrating microphones and, and making sure positions were exactly in line with various terms on microphone positioning and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not really interested in that, I'm just interested in the emotive uh, connection to a place. I'm, I'm interested in, in coming away with something that represents uh, that sense of wonder and sense of interest in the sonic textures that we can find. So I, so I, I probably am an artist. In, in most people's definition of that, uh, but really, I don't I don't pursue a career as an artist. So I'm I'm just a person doing doing this doing what I enjoy. If I stopped enjoying it, I'd stop. I wouldn't carry on applying for residences and stuff. I would just stop because if if the, if the personal enjoyment and connection's gone, then there's no point. You know.